You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts, Intelligent Talk. Happy Tuesday evening, folks. This is Scotty Roberts. Welcome to your election day. Now, we may not know yet who the President of the United States is going to be on January 20th of 2021, but uh, we'll talk about a few things during the show. I hope you went out and voted today. It's Tuesday, November 3rd, Election Day, and I want to welcome you to my show. This is Scotty Roberts. This is the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. For all of those of you who want to come and listen to the audio version of this show, you can also go find all the different outlets where this show airs or where you can find archives. And uh, the other place to find archives and to go watch this show, you can watch this show, not just listen to it. Come on over to the video simulcast at my YouTube channel. And that's mostly information I'm giving to people who've never been here before. Or if you've been here a million times and just never heard that, come on over to my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. You can see all the archives of this show. As a matter of fact, if I were to go over there right now, and let's see, let's look at uh, all the uh, different shows we have up. I can tell you exactly how many we've got up. And that is, if you uh, go to youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts, and you click on the uh, Intrepid Radio program, we have 322 videos, episodes, all uploaded to this channel. And so... Uh, uh, you're you're going to be able to come on over and spend your time here. Uh, look up all the past shows we've done. See the kind of topics. All you have to do is scroll through if you've never been here before and see the kind of topics we talk about. I tend to not like to spend a lot of time on politics, as you all know, but I do from time to time. It's rare. Now and then we get into it. I know there's a lot of people who follow me on social media, a lot of my friends. They all think all I talk about is politics. No, I talk about politics when they're pertinent to talk about. I also talk about history. I talk about archaeology. I talk about mm, paranormal things, metaphysical things, spiritual things, religious things. And all of this stuff is a big stew for me. That's the stew of life. All the different ingredients that go into it. And politics is just one of them. Uh, I try not to spend a lot of time on it, but I will house it more in current events than I do, this is a political topic now. As for right now, current events and politics, it's election day. Now, I've pre-recorded this show, so I'm not doing live commentary on the elections. Usually, between... 9 and 10 or 10 and 11 p.m. on election night, you kind of know who's going to win. I have no idea at the point of uh, recording this show earlier in the day what the results are going to be. I do know uh, that uh, already in, was it, uh, Dixville Notch or something like that, all five people voted for Biden, but like across the river, uh, all seven people voted for Trump uh, in the other little town. So, uh, who knows how things are going to turn out. Now, that was early this morning. So it'll be an interesting election. Uh, something that did come across my bow, when I drove my kids to uh, school this morning, every morning we put on uh, one of the uh, the powerhouse, you know, 50,000 watt stations uh, that uh, they don't play a lot of music. They do a lot of fun and frivolous talk in the morning. And they had some guy call in that was a business owner. And he was talking about, you know, he has the power to let people stay at work tomorrow or to let them stay home a day after the election. And he said the reason he's pondering this and he's in some quandary over it is because some of the people are Biden supporters, other people are Trump supporters. And he said there's been a lot of political infighting in so much as he allows to go on during during work hours. He even said, you know, he'll have some employees uh, leave him a message or call him on the phone or go into his office and say, you got to stop so-and-so from wearing their uh, pro-this-candidate t-shirts or hats or face masks or whatever. And he said, so he's had to deal with that for months. And he says, he's so glad it's coming to an end. But now he's got all his people pushing him to say they should be given the day off tomorrow 
to either lick their wounds or celebrate the results of this election. And uh, some of them are young people, might I say. You almost want to say millennials, but I think there's some millennials that are starting to come around. But there are younger people, he says. Some of the young people uh, say that they deserve the day off after the elections. Doesn't that just sound like a 2020 young person to you? I'm entitled to the day off because of election day. It's like, shut the hell up and get to work. And so anyway, he was wondering, he's in this quandary. Do I let them stay home the day after the election? Do I, let them, do I, do I make them come to work? Do I let those who lost the election stay home? Or what do I do? And so they were asking callers to call in. And I, of course, I'm driving my kids to school. I dropped them off and I called in. And I said, I got I to gotta call in. You guys know me. So I called in and I said, you know what? I said, I, we're all Americans. And I said, my initial answer is everybody's got to man the hell up or woman the hell up. Put on your big boy pants or your big girl panties and get your butts into work tomorrow. This is the United States of America. And if you don't know by now that you are privileged in the world to have free elections, that you have rights that give you the privilege to have a free election, and you get to go express it, that you don't need a day off to go lick your wounds because your candidate didn't win, no matter who he is. You know, and, and you know, chances are this election we may not know by tomorrow. Um, it could be a landslide, and we're going to know tonight. We don't know for sure yet. But my advice was, or my, my take on it was, get the hell to work. Tell people to grow the hell up and get their butts into work. Uh, you know what? In America, you have free elections, and that means sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And losing is part of life. So man up and get the, boy, I almost said the F word. Get the hell to work and uh, get the job done and uh, start getting along. Start figuring out how to make your life work if your candidate lost. That includes Trump supporters. That includes Biden supporters and anybody in between. My opinion is right now in an election like this, you vote for a third party. You're voting your conscience. You have the right to do that and you should do it. But you better not complain if the guy you don't want in office doesn't make it. Or if the guy you don't want in office makes it. Because love it or not, like it or not, agree with it or not, we're basically a two-party system right now. And, uh, well, we should make it a three-party system or a four or multiple parties. Well, go ahead, work at it. Make it work. But you know what? you got to convince everybody that that third-party vote isn't going to be a wasted vote. So that's the, that's the uphill challenge you have. So right now, you got two parties that are basically vying for the direction, the political direction of this country. And I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't voted yet, <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Unless you're out of the left coast and it's only 7 p.m., you might have an hour left to vote or whatever, whenever the polls close out there. But for the most part, we're all pretty much screwed no matter what side you're on right now, depending on who you voted for, who you don't like, because the voting's over. It's all the counting the votes now. And we'll see what happens. So if you're one of those people who thinks you need to take off work because your candidate lost the election, well, boo oh, let me put out my big crocodile tears for you. You know what? If my candidate loses tonight, I'll be really disappointed. And I'll have a problem with it. But you know what? I'm going to show up at work tomorrow. Well, I work here. But my life goes on. You know, when uh, when Obama won and I wasn't voting for Obama, life went on. We made it. We lived through the next day. So, uh, folks, if you're thinking uh, that direction, if your life is so wrapped up and you got to take time off, to get a box of tissues and find your quiet space because your candidate didn't win, uh, maybe you need to just check out of uh, your job altogether. Uh, give them your resignation letter and uh, head out and uh, go find your quiet place and dig in for a week or two. Otherwise, man up, ball up, woman up, 
vag up, whatever you got to do, and get into the office tomorrow, or the work, or the studio, or the warehouse, or the retail store, wherever you work, go in, you do your job, life goes on, and you make it work. And if your candidate doesn't win, maybe start tomorrow working to make sure your candidate or somebody in your political philosophy wins next time. There you go. Stop the belly aching. All right. <laughs> that's all I got to say about politics today. And for me, that's less political talk and more human talk, more current events talk. I look at downtown Minneapolis this morning. And uh, downtown Minneapolis is all boarded up. And somebody said, oh, I thought they were all boarded up because all the businesses got burned. No, only 140 businesses got burned to the ground by the protesters and the BLM people and all of that a few months ago. That's only 140 40 businesses. And that was all in the uptown neighborhood, which isn't downtown Minneapolis. It's about a mile and a half outside of the downtown area, down the main strip of Hennepin Avenue all the way down to Lake Street. Um, you're in South Minneapolis there. Downtown Minneapolis is boarded up this morning. And I, I posted a little thing on my social media this morning, and I said, hey, maybe this is kind of an unwitting poll, a poll that wasn't meant to be a poll, but was meant to be something totally different. You've got all the businesses that are boarding up their businesses just in case there's rioting due to the election results tonight. But when you look back at it, it's basically conservatives, Republicans, people on the right side of the table voting for the, the conservative candidate, uh, voting for the Trump ticket. Those aren't your people that are out burning down businesses, smashing windows, and looting them because they didn't get their way. That's usually the other side of the coin. So when you've got businesses that are boarding up in preparation for election results, without saying anything about it, what are they telling you? We're afraid Trump is going to win and the left and the progressives are all going to start rioting again and burn everything down. So the only experience we have with things being burned down and looted and smashed is from the left. And so you know what? Uh, today in Minneapolis and anywhere across the country where people are boarding up, they're prepping for the worst. And the worst is the left are going to start destroying things because they didn't get their way. They're going to go stomping. They're going to go burn your yard down because you got a Trump sign in it. Uh, those are the people you have to watch out for. Uh, there's not many people that are going to fear their houses being burned down if Biden wins and they have a Biden sign in their yard because the other side of that coin doesn't usually act that way. Um, so with all the threats and the things you hear, civil war and civil unrest and all of that, you know what's going to happen? Yeah, there will be, there could be a revolution, uh, but you're not going to see a revolution of people burning down people's houses or stealing from their businesses because their candidate didn't win on the right. You're not going to see that coming from them. So boarded up buildings in Minneapolis this morning. That's a poll. That's telling me most of the people in Minneapolis think that Donald Trump is going to win tonight. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, that's my take on that, and we'll leave it right there. All right, today we're going to get back into talking about parenting a little bit, but parenting those adult kids. And maybe you don't have adult kids. Maybe you're not even a parent. Well, that's all right. There's a lot of other stuff that mixes into this and... Uh, uh, um, sets our uh, the tone of the way we live and the way we do things. So uh, fret not. This not the show might not be directly for you. It's not really even directly for me, but it's a show that helps us understand how we parent early on. And you might not be a parent at all. You might not be married. You might not have kids. You might not ever want kids. But uh, a lot of us have little kids. Some of us have adult kids. Some of us are old enough to be have them out of the house and dealt with some of this. Others, we get to look forward to that. And so I want to talk about this. And that's my way of saying it's all pertinent. Listen anyway. Even if you don't have kids or not ever going to have kids, listen to the show. 
uh, stay tuned with this show. Keep tuned in. Come on over to the chat room. Add your two cents worth. You know why? Because these are topics of life. This is what life is about. And if you're not dealing with it, maybe your brother or sister is, maybe your cousin is, maybe your friends are, maybe your neighbors are. This is a way to understand life and how life works. And if you don't have kids, you've never been a parent, you may not understand what parenting's all about. This lets you know a little bit. You might have a textbook idea or an idea because you've watched people who have kids. Uh, but like they say, you don't know unless you were there. Um, you know, I didn't know as much about parenting as I do now. I've got three older ones that are grown up and out of the house, and I've got three little ones that are still in grade school. So it's an interesting life. And uh, so let's move on into this. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about when adult children break your heart. It's uh, watching adult kids of ours stumble and fall and how all parents of adult children know that parenting doesn't stop at that magic age of 18. And we started looking at uh, uh, simple recommendations that can go a long way toward minimizing and preventing all this unnecessary conflict with adult children of ours. The first one we already talked about was, how do you know when it's okay to advise your children? Uh, how do you advise them? Why do you advise them? How do you advise them? And your kids require most of all for you to love them for who they are, not to spend your whole time trying to correct them. The second point we already covered yesterday was, what if an adult child doesn't seem to be behaving in a mature way? And that can come out in lots of different ways. There are adults that are on their own. They might be in college. They might be out of college. Oh, and by the way, that's another question when you're, that we didn't address last night. When your kids go to college, are they paying for their own college? Are you paying for their college? Uh, are they, are they, uh, do they have scholarships? Do they have financial grant and aids? Do they have loans? I heard one financial guru many years ago. I'm talking almost 30 years ago. Uh, he had a radio show. And he always talked like this. And he would talk about, hey, Tiger, uh, how you doing tonight? And I, could, I don't even remember the guy's name. But somebody asked him about, you know, what do I do with my college fund for my kids? What's the best way to manage it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, well, first he said, let me say something about I got college funds for kids. And he kind of hooked me on this way back. He says, parents shouldn't pay for their college, edu the college education of their kids. Now, if you want to set up a little savings plan and do something with your kid and say, I, I'm going to deposit so much money so you have a little money to go on when you go, that's fine. Uh, he says, but for the most part, let your kids learn about the responsibility of living adult life by funding their own way through college. He says, your kid that's going to get straight A's or do well in college are more likely to be kids who had to pay for it themselves. And there's a lot of other things to do in life other than go to college. You go look at MicroWorks, which we mentioned yesterday, microworks.org. And uh, look at Mike Rowe's take on going to trade school, getting your high school diploma and going to trade school. There's a lot of jobs and a lot of people who contribute a lot to society and a lot of people who do very well in life financially because they're in a trade and they make that trade work for them. There's a lot of people in trades that have their own businesses. And uh, so my, my, my short advice to you, don't pay for your kid's education. If you're putting money away for your kid's college fee fund, stop there. Rename the fund. Call it our RV mobile uh, uh, camper uh, fund. Call it your uh, trip around the world fund for when my kids move out of the house and go to college on their own. My whatever fund. My retirement fund. That is your money. Your kids can get loans. They can get, they can work their way through college. I had nobody gave me any money for my college, and I worked my way through college. I worked my way through seminary. Now, on the other hand, as I mentioned yesterday, 
I got a full scholarship and grant and aid to go to the University of Minnesota. Big school, Big Ten school. But uh, I, I didn't take that because I was convinced by my church that I would be outside of God's will if I didn't go to the Bible college. So I went to the Bible college. I still worked my way through. Nobody paid my way for me. And uh, you know what? Your kids are going to appreciate their education more if they have to spend their own money doing it. If they have to take out a loan that, that uh, they have to repay. And you know what? Without getting into the politics of the cost of education nowadays, the cost of college loans, there ain't nothing wrong. If you can take out a 30-year loan to buy a house, you can take out a loan that's going to take you 10 years to pay off to go to school. If that's your choice in life, is to go to university or college. And there are lots of other things you can do, but you know what? If you're going to take out a loan, if you're going to go to school, you can pay your own way. And parents, parents with young kids, you don't have to set up college funds. You can set up a fund for your kids, so maybe you've got a little little gift, a little nest to give them, a little egg to give them. Nest egg is not the term, but a little something to give them when they graduate and go off to school or go out on their own. But don't be overburdened with making sure you save up 100000 to $200,000 a year for their education. They can pay for their own education. If they want to get ahead, they will do it. That's all i got to say about that. Uh, don't waste your time and money. So, uh, so we were on that second point, just in review. We were just still reviewing yesterday. What if an adult child doesn't seem to behave maturely, whether they're in college or out of college? How do you act? We covered that yesterday. Um, how does your does your child now act entitled to and demand things you once enjoyed giving them? Car privileges, gifts, perks at home, rent money. Does it feel like you're living from crisis to crisis with your adult child? Do you sacrifice too much to meet your adult child's needs? Are you afraid of hurting your child? Are you, afraid, are you feeling burdened, used, resentful, burnt out? You know, there's nothing wrong with helping your kids when they're adults. As uh, my father-in-law a long time ago once said to me with my ex-wife, they gave us some help on starting a business, and, and he said, do this for your kids someday. So there you go. You pass it on. Uh, so seeking professional help and support could help you in this if you've got questions about that, if you're in a quandary about it. The third point we covered last night what if your child, adult child, stops having the same values that you brought them up with? Um, is your relationship significant enough to you to maintain when your child may have different points of view than you? Can you negotiate to agree to disagree? If your relationship comes first, how, you, how will you move forward? If you're a Presbyterian and your kid's a, 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 a pagan, an acorn shaker... Uh, how are you going to deal with that? Often it's the adjustment of our expectations rather than reality itself. That's the hurdle we have to leap. And that's the quote we left off on yesterday. Often it's the adjusting of our own expectations of our kids rather than reality itself. That's the hurdle we have to leap in life. That's where we left off at the end of last night's show. That's where we got to leave off on the first half of tonight's show. We're going to come back and talk, how can you have a healthy financial boundary with your kids? So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Are you looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration. He knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than I've been alive. Go to scottallenroberts.com. That's Scott with two T's, A-L-A-N-R-O-B-E-R-T-S dot com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651 468 8115. Now go out and kick some ass with some kick ass graphic design. Hi, I'm my dad. So he can take me to Disneyland. All right, gang, welcome back. Thanks for sitting on through that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, The Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O D Y S Y 1.com. Come on over, see all the goodness that's Odyssey Radio. At the same time, why don't you come on over and watch the video simulcast of this program over on my YouTube channel and join the live chat room on fire tonight going on right now over at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. While you're there, check out the archives. And uh, all through your days, for the next 100 days, you could be listening to back editions of this show. So come on over, youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. At the same time, by the way, I make my living doing lots of different things. And uh, one of them is I'm a graphic designer, an artist, and illustrator. You can come over to scottallenroberts.com. That's Scott with two T's, A-L-A-N, roberts.com. Click on the art and design link. You're going to see all the stuff I do. Logo designs, corporate identity stuff, illustration, book illustration, book design, brochures, pamphlets, blah, 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 all the websites, all that stuff that you need graphics for, I'm your guy. Come on over, take a peek. Um, and um, what else do I have over there? That's it for now. You can go to my Etsy page as well. Etsy.com slash shop slash son of a patriot and see all the designs like this one uh, that I'm wearing here, the Think shirt, all the different designs that are up there. Avail yourself of some great t-shirts and hoodies and coffee mugs and stuff like that. So come on over, get your stuff there. Uh, and there's some people in this chat room tonight that have gotten a lot of stuff from that store. Ask them what they think if you're over in the chat room. Now let's move on with this program. We're talking about adult kids having kids. Kids that have grown up with us are sweet little cute Baby kids, our little toddlers, our young grade school kids that turn into angsty, uh, rotten teenagers and then uh, go out on their own and become successful in life, we hope. Uh, what do you do when you have some problems with them? How can you set up boundaries with them? How can you help them and still maintain boundaries? So we want to see them succeed. Now... <laughs> I'm one of those lucky parents with my da my twin daughters who are, I mentioned yesterday, they're 28. Uh, they started a business almost right out of college. They ended up dropping out of college to make this business work, so they never finished their college degrees, but they're doing fantastic. They're in their ninth year, and uh, they're doing amazingly well. They're, they're mermaid tail. If you want to go see what they do, go to finfolk dot com f i n f is in frank f i n f is in frank o l k finfolk dot com or finfolkproductions dot com you can find them on facebook you can just go to their website and you see what they do um, and uh, they're very successful they're good at what they do they've never needed my help they've just needed my moral support which was easy to give and uh, so I was one of those lucky parents. I've got my 19-year-old boy who's had some problems, and he struggles a little bit, uh, but he's a fantastic young man, and uh, uh, he needs a little moral support every now and then. He's never, one time, has he asked me for money, and it was like a hundred bucks, uh, and so, uh, um, and I was happy to help him out, and uh, uh, so while he's not making the kind of money his sisters make, he's struggling to make his own path. 
And uh, so that's a good thing. But there are parents that really have to help out their kids, and financial issues can arise. Now, do you have kids that have needed your financial help? Uh, they can arise when a parent's perceived by the child as being unfair. That can cause financial problems. When they're be perceived as being unfair, inequitable, in what money they distribute or help or give to one child and not the other. And issues can arise if one child, adult child, is always asking for money and being given it, whereas the other adult children who work hard never ask and never get given any money. And so remember, there are usually no secrets amongst siblings. Your kids are always going to find out what's going on with each other, and then issues might arise. So if an adult child, if, they're if, if they perceive favoritism is occurring, uh, then it becomes a different problem, not just finances. And it might hurt their relationships and their relationship with you. But there's a difference, however, in an adult child who's experiencing significant financial difficulty, but is doing everything in their power to get out of the situation and try to help themselves. Obviously, the loving thing to do if you're in a position to do so would be to help them out. And if your adult child is struggling because they're waiting for the perfect job or they lack the motivation to help themselves, then experiencing the, the discomfort that lack of money brings, along with eating canned soup on crackers, noodles, or bread and nothing else week after week, may provide the incentive needed for them to get themselves together and off their butts. And if you leap immediately with freshly cooked food and money for meals and paying other bills, and they're never going to have an opportunity to learn. That doesn't mean you don't help them out. Hey, you're struggling. Hey, uh, here's some food. Hey, a bunch of bag of groceries. Uh, now, that's not going to last you long. You know, you need some help. Get moving. So not being able to go out socializing with peers or not being able to participate in other holidays as they can't pay their way are all life consequences from choosing not to look for work any work at all, that are going to help them pay their way. So if you honestly feel that your child is about to make a financial decision they can ill afford, then a gentle reminder that if it doesn't work out, you might not be in any position to bail them out. And that might be all it needs to help them make the right decision. Uh, no matter how much it kills you to watch him or her or your children have to sell the car they love, or lose it to a creditor. Keep your hands in your pockets and your mouth shut. Fewer words and more meaningful action can communicate the message without drowning the relationship in a sea of verbal conflict. So, that's a, a topic I hate, uh, is the financial stuff. But if your kid's not... Now, my mom was never in a position to help me out if I needed it. My mom let me... I moved back in with her once... When I got divorced when I was 40, I was a 40, uh, 39 to 40, I was the 40-year-old guy in my mom's basement, but I was only there for a couple of months till I got my own place. And uh, I didn't mooch off my mom. I wasn't planning on living there for very long. I got my own place pretty quick. I also got custody of my kids, and I needed my own house to do that. So that's about the most my mom has been able to to, as my parent to help me when I needed it and not that she didn't want to so I just did I knew she uh, she was fine she was living okay she was doing okay but uh, I would have put a strain on her if she was going to financially help me out I, she couldn't do that and I knew that as a responsible adult so money 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 let's move on from that uh, money can be a killer but uh, your child experiencing some of the hardships of not having it is something that is a growing lesson in their lives. And sometimes you just got to go, I can't, I can't help you out. Uh, I love you, and I'm here for you as much as I can be, but I can't bail you out. I can't give you money to do that. Um, I mean, I can maybe slip you a couple bucks here and there, but not much I can do. And maybe, and even if you have it, that might be the wise path to take. Uh, unless they're really hurt and they're really down, then maybe there's some time where you can step in and you can do something to help. Hey, let me help you out. So God knows 
uh, I've been bailed out by parents and grandparents before uh, over, hey, uh, our car broke down. We need to get a new car. Um, uh, here you go. Here's a few thousand bucks. This was going to be your inheritance, but I'll give it to you now. Get your new car. Things like that have happened in our family. So uh, uh, anyway, there you go. So now uh, let's look at number five. Let's move on from that. What if you don't get on with your child's significant other? Oh, that's a biggie. I just mentioned last night, I went through that with my own son. I didn't, I, I wasn't a big fan of the girl he was dating. And it was mostly because, not because she didn't fit my standard. It was that I thought she was way too young. She was still in high school. She had just turned 18. Now, granted, my son was only a year older than her. But my only opposition internally was, dude, you don't have a job. And the job you, well, the job you have is, you know, you're working as a clerk at a grocery store or the McDonald's counter type of thing. Um, you need to get yourself a little more established before you start getting tied down to marriage and the possibility of kids that comes with it. That was my advice. Hey, consider that you could take a few years to get yourself established before you get really tied down. But what if you don't get along with them? That's maybe a little different. Not getting along with your child's chosen partner in life. That might not be when they're 19 years old. It might be when they're 26 years old. Um, that's a challenging situation. Getting on with a difficult daughter-in-law or son-in-law can make life extremely difficult and harrowing, especially if you feel like you're always walking on eggshells. Now, let me tell you something. When my 26-year-old wife started dating me at 44, 45, we're 19 years apart, when we started dating, I think she was 25 and I was 44 when we first started hanging out, uh, but uh, 26 and, and, and uh, 45, um, uh, her mom had, uh, I'm four years older than my mother-in-law. So, you want to say there wasn't a little, there was not strife, but there was, you could feel there was some uncomfortab uh, uncomfortableness there from her mom to me. It didn't bother me at all. <laughs> so, uh, never criticize your partner's, uh, I'm sorry, your child's, partner. Don't do it. Rainey and I have now been together for 15 years. As uh, many of you already know, because I've said it a hundred times uh, last week, because it was my 13th anniversary last week, wedding anniversary. But criticism only leads to estrangement. Your adult child is most likely going to tell their partner what you said. And this isn't going to help your situation. Uh, it's the opposite of what happens. Remember, we talked about, was it yesterday or the day before? No, last week, we talked about if you're having problems with your spouse, don't tell your parents or your family about it. You know why? Because what if you fix that problem at home and then your parents already have a bias against your partner? Don't do it, guys. Same thing the other way around. Respect the fact that your child has chosen this person. Always speak respectfully to them even if they don't speak the same way back. Stay cordial. Be polite. Again, even if they do not act that way, pretend there's someone you would have to work with and get on with your working life. You wouldn't swear at them or shut the door in their face. Extend the same courtesy. You know what? When I didn't like the fact that my son was dating the woman he dated, I didn't treat her badly at all. I treated her with respect. And as I mentioned last night, I said, hey, uh, because it was in a situation where it was almost like I was forced to say something. And I said, hey, I love you too. And I said, you know why? I said, I don't really know you. I said, but I love you because my son loves you. And that was the truth. I was going to respect my son's decisions. Now, if grandchildren are involved, remember that they can't they can control your access to your grandkids. There's usually absolutely nothing you can do about this. You need to decide for the sake of building a relationship with your grandchildren what you're prepared to put up with or tolerate. 
Um, I think uh, 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 deep in uh, some in-laws' minds are the fact that or if there's any reason my child dies or my child has a divorce and loses custody of their kids, that uh, I may not have every access to see my grandkids anymore. You have to think about those things. So there's some diplomacy that's needed. Accept the reality of this situation that your kid is in. And that uh, this person is the in-law that you have. Not the one you may wish to you had. They are who they are. And you need to be able to work with this person. If at all possible, never try and put a wedge between your adult child and their partner. Oh my God, you're going to lose that one. Don't work at putting a wedge in. Moms, don't come in between your daughters and their husbands or your, your sons and their wives. Don't do it. You're going to ruin. If you don't ruin their relationship, you're going to ruin yours with your kid. Try to be laid back. Don't take things too personally. Often, getting to know someone can help misconceptions, misunderstandings, and difficulties. And often over time, being on hand to offer practical assistance and smoothing the way can do wonders to break down barriers. Do whatever you can to show that you're the loving parent to your child and therefore their partner, even if you don't like them or got a reason you think you shouldn't like them. Get over it! You can never alter another kid's behavior, uh, another person's behavior especially your, your kid, you can only alter your own behavior. Ask yourself these questions and honestly answer them. Have you ever spoken unkindly about your child's partner? Do you ever complain about them to your son or your daughter? Have you criticized them? Do you need to apologize to them? Would that make a difference? Do not make the apology conditional on them also apologizing to you. This is about you taking responsibility and trying to heal a wound. You cannot put a plaster on an injury and then rip it straight off again before the wound has a chance to recover. Does this person know they're important to you? And why? Has this person got abilities, gifts, and strengths? Have you delved the depths looking for those? Have you acknowledged them when you find them? What is this person doing right? Have you ever tried to do anything special just for them, with no expectations of thanks or anything in return? If you do this, you know you're doing what you can to heal and build a relationship. Have you asked them why they do not like you if their unkindness is very direct? Listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. Don't pass judgment. Don't justify. Thank them for telling you. And not in a condescending, well, thanks for that, asshole. You know, no. Listen to them. Thank them. Well, thanks for letting me know what you think. Let them know you're going to need to think about the situation before replying. All of this takes maturity, guys. If you need time, especially if you're angry, you might need time to reply to them. Maybe there's been a misunderstanding or a miscommunication, and this could be an opportunity to clear it up. Maybe sometimes they're just dicks, and you got to deal with it. you got to help your kid deal with it, too. Are you always trying to advise their spouse, their significant other? And is it driving a wedge between you and them and you and your kid? Can you decide to stop doing this unless you're asked for an opinion? Can you offer help without being critical? Those are things you have to consider. Sometimes our kids get involved with people that we don't like and we don't think are good for them. It starts in their friendships. You ever notice that? Sometimes there's friends when your kids were young your 13-year-old kid gets involved with somebody, you go, I don't like that kid. You don't need to be hanging with that kid. Um, you know how well that goes over. Imagine when they're adults. They think they're old enough to make their own decisions. And they are, but they're going to make mistakes too. And you don't want to see your kid going through divorce. 
And so many times the motivation is, what can I do to help my child? Many times by being an antagonist, you don't help the situation at all. So there you go. Let's move on from that. The sixth thing that we're looking at is how do you keep healthy boundaries and relate to an adult child who moves back home? <laughs> we're seeing more. I, I looked up a bunch of articles on this. You know, there's a lot more kids moving back home as adults nowadays. And there's so much so that there's a lot of psychological advice on how to make your re, your 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 newly reblended family work. What do you do when the kids move back home? And here is a top 10 list of how to make that work well for you. Uh, because there's a lot of kids doing it. Now, according to an article in CBS News, the Pew Research Center uh, reported that 32.1% of 18 to 34 year olds lived at their parents' home in in uh, recent years. We're talking. This is uh, uh, going up to 2019. That's 32.1 uh, percent, and this is the highest rate of adult children living with their parents since the Great Depression. Now, high rates of student debt, skyrocketing house prices, decreased earnings, divorce returning to higher education, increased demand for rentals, are all believed to be contributing factors. It's expensive to live out there now. And if you've only got one income, you're alone. It's really expensive to live. I look at this uh, townhome my wife and I are in. Now, we had a little place that we lost three years ago. We lost it. There's a long story there, and I've told it here before, and I don't need to tell it again. We didn't lose it because we did wrong things. We were just in a bad contract situation. But we lost a house. We had four acres. of It was wooded acres with the big ponds and the woods. I mean, this was a gorgeous piece of land and a nice house sitting on it. We lost that house, but... What we were paying for that house is about $100 a month less than we pay to rent a house that's only about two-thirds the size of that one with a, a, a big yard, but you know, basically your, your one-sixteenth of an acre plot of land uh, living uh, communally. We're in a side-by-side, uh, -side, it's not a duplex, it's townhomes. So we got somebody on the other side of that wall right there. And so, uh, at least they're not upstairs or downstairs. So, it's expensive to live is the point I'm making. We're paying more to live here in a rental place than it was to have four acres in a big house. And so, uh, um, in her book, Monica Steinish, Boomerang Kids, When Children Move Back Home, she wrote that parents need to have a conversation at the very start with their adult child about the financial expectations that are with them living at home. When I moved back in with my mom during my separation, which turned into the divorce, it was going to be a divorce, but the first, the initial leaving home, um, I moved in with my mom. We set up expectations. She set up hers of me, I of her. She said, look, I got this basement. Somebody rented there. Uh, if you want to take it, I'm not going to charge you for the for." You know, if you stay here for a few months, that's fine. If it goes prolonged, we'll talk about rent and responsibility. And so uh, I help pay uh, electric and stuff like that. And and uh, she knew what my situation was. And I was only there a, a couple, three months, if memory serves well, before I got my own place. But uh, you need to set up rules and boundaries. And in uh, Steinish's book, she suggests discussing with your adult child and coming to an agreement over such things as, one, agreed rent that they're going to pay. If you're going to get get them to pay rent, then put it in writing. If the rent is raised over some time, starting low as they get back on their feet, then in, include this in the agreement. No misunderstandings, even with your kids. Say, look, we're going to put this in writing so there's never a misunderstanding about our situation together. Uh, two, how long they expect to stay. Uh, get the get these boundaries set up. 
get them to give you a possible end date. Hey, uh, Dad, Mom, I'm going to be here for six months, okay? Help me get back on my feet. A year, two months, whatever. Uh, three, how much are they going to contribute to the household expenses, the utilities, the cable bill, the garbage bill, the electric bill? Uh, if they're unemployed, what are their plans for employment or for their education? Are they going to sit on their butts at home watching TV? Or are you going to say, hey, look, come on in, but I need you next week? Boom, out there, hitting the pavement. Find your job. Uh, how much are you prepared to help them out financially or not help them out at all? What if they're bringing in no money? Hey, Dad, Mom, can I have 100 bucks? I want to take a date out. That's a tough one, too. It's easy to be judgmental. Hey, if you're living in our house and you're dating, are you going to screw in the basement while we're upstairs? Are you going to... If you don't have a job, do you want to borrow 100 bucks from me to take your date out to McDonald's? Which is about what it costs nowadays. Okay, and is there a plan to pay your parents back for what they're doing for you? Do they need to pay off debt? If so, how much and... How do they plan to pay this debt off, and over what period? Do you still require them to pay you something toward the cost of living while they live with you, while they do this? If so, let them know. What are your financial plans going to be impacted negatively by your adult child moving home? And how much will this be a consideration or a strain? How much can you offer them help? We always want to have a place. If I could right now, I'd offer my, my 19-year-old son, come, I wish you could come back home and have a room here. And live here and get your life together. Go back to school, whatever you need to do uh, to get things working for you. I wish I could do that. We don't have the room, first of all, so we can't offer it. And we don't have the money to put them up. All we can do is offer them some good support. Um, there's a social psychologist, Jane Adams, who said this. What's really going on in many cases is that kids today don't want to share a place with three roommates take the bus to work, and in general, struggle to get on their feet. Kids often don't realize that their parents may have worked hard for 25 years to achieve the now freer lifestyle that they have without kids. You start out poor, that's the lesson. Now, it's like, again, saving for your kid to go to college, let your kid do it. Start out poor, eat those crackers and eat that ramen soup ramen noodles for a year while you're paying your way through school. Some parents take the money off their adult children and put it in a savings account to give back to their adult children once they leave. However, this comes down to affordability. If an adult child knows a parent is doing this, they may be less likely to pay consistently as they might conclude their money isn't needed and so it's not essential to keep their agreement. What if your adult child wishes to drive your car? What about your car insurance? Oh, there was a guy from Insurance Information Network of California who said, Not adding your child to your policy puts you at risk of being uncovered if he or she has an accident while driving your vehicle. That's an adult child at your house. Do they have a car? Do they have a way to get around? Or do you tell them, hey, take the bus? So, uh, you know what? Uh, um, I had a car. I didn't use my mom's car when I lived with her for a few months. Um, it was ridiculous. I had to have a car of my own. So all these things are what go on. Our children can have their tantrums without triggering us. The more we hone this ability to meet life in a neutral state without attributing goodness or badness to what we're encountering, but simply accepting it as isness the less our need to interrupt or interpret every dynamic as if it were about us. Uh, our kids can have their tantrums without triggering us. We can correct their behavior without dumping on them from our own residual resentment, guilt, fear, or distrust. So in summary, the best advice for parents of children is not to advise unless you're asked or if you feel your adult child might be in actual physical danger you didn't speak up. So there's a lot to this. There's a lot more to this, but I'm going to leave it off at that. And uh, remember, 
uh, what the Persian prophet and poet said. This is Khalil Gibran. He said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer seeks the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends with he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. Folks, have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow night.